Okay, so let's get stuck in with this tutorial. The introduction briefly recaps all the uh, the concepts that uh, Eric also visited in the lectures. So it starts out by um, basically introducing the, uh, the convolution operator. So this is, can you guys see my mouse by the way? This up here is the, the continuous convolution operator as it is implemented in CNNs. And actually in CNNs, of course, you implement a discretized version of this operation. Since while your input data also is discretized, of course, images are a discrete sampling of a, of a continuous function. Um, and this exact operator is, is the one that we're gonna try to generalize in, in this tutorial. So after the recap on CNNs, we give a brief recap on the ideas behind GCNNs. Uh, and well, I think as Eric discussed, there, there are basically three operations that, that make up regular group convolution on neural networks. And those are the lifting convolution. And oop, the idea behind the lifting convolution is basically, um, well, since your data, your input data generally is, is a, a 2D image, 2D image, for example, um, you would need to, uh, so this input data contains features that, that occur under, under different poses. So for example, if you're, if we're looking at, at, uh, rotor translation, equivariant GCNN, so GCNNs that are equivariant to translations as well as, uh, or rotations as well as translations, your input image in 2D contains features that occur under different rotations. So under different orientations. And the lifting convolution essentially maps from your input space to uh, to the group itself. So by applying a kernel, and the the uh, intuition is quite quite simple. By applying a kernel, not only at every translation in the input, so at every location in the input, you also apply the kernel at every orientation, so at every rotation in the input. So you get a response for every location in your input image, but also for every orientation. And that way you, you expand your feature map where it's now defined not over um, the, the 2D domain, so over R2, but over the entire group. So over R2 as well as the rotation group. So the first operation that we need for GCN GCNNs is this lifting operator. Subsequently, we will have feature maps which are defined over the group itself, and we can do actual well, are actual group convolutions. So, um, yeah, important to note for this operation is that your kernel now also has a as like an, an orientation or uh, is transformed under a given group element H, um, and this this can also be, of course, other groups. So this works for rotations, but it's also been applied for, for other groups like uh, scalings, for example, dilations. Um, well, after applying this lifting convolution, you end up with a feature map that is not only defined over R2, but also over the rotation group, so over the entire group G, which means that as if you want to do a convolution in subsequent layers, so if you want to do actual group convolutions in subsequent layers, the convolution now is an integral over the entire group. So this means your feature map is defined over the entire group. So for every group element in the group, so for every translation and rotation combination, you have a feature, basically a feature value. And you uh, apply a group convolution by taking a, an inner product of this feature map with a kernel K, which is now also defined over the group. So for conventional CNNs, your kernels are only defined over the spatial domain. And of course, um, there's also the, the notion of input and output channels, but for this theoretical treatment, that's, that's not really important. You can kind of forget about it. We'll get to that uh, a bit later. So in conventional CNNs, the kernel is only defined over the spatial domain, but in group convolutions, the kernel is also defined over the, the, for example, the rotation domain. So over the entire group. Um, and we will be looking at a specific type of group called an affine group. And affine groups are basically always combinations of this, the translation group and some group H of interest. 
as it turns out, you can then um, split the action of such a group. So for example, the action of the rotor translation group, you can split it into a rotation part and a translation part. And in practice, this is also how we will be implementing it. So that's what you see here in the second line. Um, is the, the the basically the split actions of the of the rotation and the uh, translation group, for example. So this basically gives you a convolution operation, which is defined over the entire group, and it also as an output maps again to the entire group. So the input feature maps for this operation are feature maps defined over the group. And the output operations of this operate, the output feature maps of this operation are also defined over group. And then lastly, um, Eric also discussed the the projection layer. So in the end, we would want most of our uh, networks to actually be invariant to rotations. So whereas these lifting and group convolutions make our network equivariant so this basically means that if you rotate something in your input then you will have the same activation throughout the network only at different locations in the feature maps so the same information is still stored throughout the network it's just stored at a different location in the feature maps um, but we would like our network to actually be invariant to these transformations and you can do that by uh, after having a, a number of group convolution layers applying a uh, a projection so you could think of, of max projection mean projection any operation that is invariant to the action of the group so uh, for example you could just take the average over the entire feature map that is defined over the uh, over the group and you'd end up with a single point and this single point is then invariant to transformations uh, in the input. Um, okay, so that's the, the, the global introduction. Next, uh, we import a number of packages that we'll need for this tutorial. So we're going to make use of PyTorch. I think you all should already be quite familiar with PyTorch. We'll also use PyTorch Lightning to make uh, the training and saving of our models a bit easier. Um, you should have seen all this in Deep Learning 1, I think. If you need a refresher, I've uh, added the link here, which uh, links back to Philip Lippis tutorials on uh, PyTorch Lightning. Um, next, um, we start by implementing the actual group. So remember, the, the group is uh, defined by a tuple, a set of elements, and a group product. And the first thing we need to do is implement this, this group action and implement the entire group actually. So the group product operation has this, this couple of, of uh, uh, requirements that it needs to satisfy. And we'll uh, have to take these into account when we're implementing the group. And then next, since we want to actually uh, transform our kernels using these uh, this group, We'll also need to implement uh, the regular representation, which is basically the the matrix instantiation of, of a, a group element in R2, for example. Um, so the base class that we give here is, is uh, built up in such a way, the idea is at least that if you implement for a new group, if you'd like to implement a new group, all you have to do is implement these methods and the rest of the network should still stay intact, should work, should be equivariant to that group. So these are all the, the operations that we'll need um, throughout our, our group convolutional networks. Um, so for example, we implement the group product, we implement a way to sample the group elements. So the group elements, for example, in the rotation group could just be rotation angles, and the group product would then be the, the product of these rotation angles an inverse for the rotation group would be just inverting the rotation and then we also need to implement the the, the action on r2 so we'll be working with uh, 
kernel grids. So a grid over of points over which your kernel is defined, and we'll need to be able to transform this kernel grid with the group action. And this is the function that will, will do that. Um, as we could see here above, we also need to implement the action on of the group on itself, which is just basically the, the group product, as you can see here later. Let's see, a question. Shouldn't left action language be named batch product or something similar as it is not an action over some space, it is over the group? Um, well, yeah, it's not an action over some space, over the group. Um, sure, I mean, that's fine as well, I think. <laughs> uh, we can discuss naming conventions all we want, of course, but uh, yeah, let's, uh, I mean, yeah, indeed. As I was saying as well, this left action on H is just, uh, uh, it's going to be implemented using the, the group product, of course, since uh, the action of the group on itself is realized through the group product. Um, all right, so next we will also need a matrix representation. So for the left regular representation that we saw here, we see that we're actually going to uh, apply the group action onto the domain of the kernel, which means that we'll need to find a representation for these group elements in the, the base space of our kernels, in the domain of our kernels. This comes about through a matrix representation. So for rotations, this would just simply be a rotation matrix in two dimensions. And then lastly, um, to be completely accurate, we'll also need to implement this determinant of the matrix representation of a group element H. For when you're working with, with um, groups like the rotation group, this doesn't matter. Um, so th this determinant, it's named in this side note. Um, there's a, uh, it's basically a scaling factor which accounts for the possible um, effect that the group action may have on volumes in uh, in R2. So your group action could have an effect on a volume in R2. So again, for rotations, the rotation, uh, the action of the rotation group on volumes on R2 is, there, there is no action. Volumes on R2 are actually invariant to rotations. So if you rotate a volume in R2, the volume stays the same. But for example, if you want to implement the dilation group, um, the group action is actually going to have an effect on, on volumes defined over R2. And then this term accounts for that in, in making sure that this integral is uh, implemented correctly, basically. But again, since we're only going to look at rotations in this uh, tutorial, we don't, we don't actually need to implement this function. And then lastly, um, the method we'll use to actually sample our kernels uh, requires our kernel grids to be defined over the interval minus one to one. So um, although the group elements itself aren't necessarily, don't necessarily fall into this interval, this function is there to make sure that before we input or before we apply this, the, the, the method, to, method to actually sample our convolution kernels, we make sure that the, the uh, elements are scaled in such a way that they actually fall into this uh, domain. So next, we implement the cyclic group, C4, this is the, the group of 90 degree rotations. There's four group elements. Um, and its representation on R2 is given by, its matrix representation on R2 is given by this rotation matrix. And here you can, you can uh, go through it yourself later, I'll not go in too much detail, but essentially here we implement all the, the necessary functions that, uh, that we defined above. So for example, the group product here is just the product of the two representations, modulo uh, two pi, to make sure that this, the group product satisfies this, this uh, closure, where is it, closure constraint that we defined here. So taking the group product should always end up uh, with another group element. 
Um, and then, for example, the left action on R2. Here we implemented also batchwise. So I guess you could also change this name if you'd like. But um, basically, what happens here is is for every group element in the input, we create a matrix representation and we apply the matrix representation to the input uh, curl on grid. Um, Left action on H, as we were just discussing, indeed, it just comes down to a group product. Um, but here implemented batch wise. And then the matrix representation is just as simple as, as making, creating a, uh, a uh, well, a rotation matrix from the uh, group input element. Um, next, we can look at the results of the uh, the group that we implement. So here we have an input image. We create a grid corresponding to the pixel locations in this input image. And we can now transform this grid using the group action. So if we take two, the product of two group elements here, for example, G1 and G2, we would end up with group element G3, which is a rotation of 270 degrees. If we apply this action, on the uh, image grid that we defined, we get the transformed grid. And if we subsequently use the, the grid sampling method that uh, Torch defines for us, which is also actually how we'll be sampling our convolution kernels, we can basically this, this, um, this function interpolates an input image with the grid that it gets as an input. So we see that indeed our grid is rotated clockwise by 270 degrees. All right, and next we'll get to the uh, actual implementation of the group convolutional networks. Let's see, two questions. Can you explain the einsum in left action on R2? Yes, and what's the first dimension of in grid R2? Okay, so um, to answer the first question, which will help me answer the second question, uh, this grid is of shape 2 by 512 by 512. So 2 since uh, every coordinate is two-dimensional, and then the height and width of the image. So this is also the grid, the dimensionality of the grid that it serves as input for the uh, function that we defined for left action R2. So we'll go to that function now. Um, okay, so remember, we're also inputting a, a batch of group elements here. So we're basically applying the group action of a batch of group elements at to the same grid at the same time using this einsum. So we get a a tensor that contains the matrix representation for each of these groups, group elements and stacks it in the first dimension. And then this einsum basically just applies uh, the matrix product of each of these representations to the uh, input grids. So remember this input grid that we had here is of dimension two by height by width. And then this batch of matrix representations is of size batch by uh, two by two. And basically we just apply, take the inner product of these two dimensions. So um, just applying the, the matrix product of each of these matrix representations to each of the uh, input grid points. And you'll end up with the transformed grid points. Is that clear? Okay, I'm gonna assume that it's clear. Oh, let's see. So we have a three by three rotation matrix. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we're, we're this code is implemented for uh, groups that act on R two. So rotations in two dimensions, for example. If you were to gener want to generalize this to higher dimensional um, input domains and higher dimensional groups, 
then indeed it's for three by three rotation matrix. Um, the input grid also would have to uh, be of the same dimensionality. So it, you would have a an input that is defined over three dimensions. So your grid would also be so the grid coordinates would also be three dimensional. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, another question. Can you maybe explain what the grid sample expects as an argument, since we're using it quite a lot in a notebook, as in how does the lint space mesh grid represent the transformation of each pixel? All right, so um, the mesh grid is just a grid of coordinates containing the coordinate, a coordinate for every location in our image. So our image is, an, is a, basically a... a, a you could see it as as, as a as a two dimensional grid with a height of five hundred and twelve and a width of five hundred and twelve, and then every one of these pixels has an as a location corresponding to it, and the grid that we give as input to the grid sample function um, is pretty much of the same dimensionality, only that the Grid sample function also works batch wise. So let's first inspect the image grid itself. So the image grid first dimension is two since our grid or our input image is two dimensional. So you could, should see it as, as this first uh, tensor here is the X coordinates. The second tensor here is the Y coordinates. And for example, the leftmost upper, upper leftmost point has uh, the coordinate minus one, minus one. And then if we apply the group action to this grid, now the dimensionality changes because we uh, we made a, or we implemented the this action batchwise. So let's see what the dimensionality now is. So we only input one um, single group element here. So the first dimension is one. Let's see if we can check it this way. Um, oh, what I should have explained also in the, uh, the einsum operation here, we or after the einsum operation here, we additionally uh, perform a roll over the the coordinates, so over the x and y dimensions of the coordinates because. Well, this is something that um, we we took some time to figure out as well. But the grid sample function apparently expects first y and then x as dimensions for the input grid. So we perform a roll over this as well, um, and then I should have said I should have also uh, given a quick note about the uh, the output dimensionality of this uh, ein sum. As you can see here, the um, whereas the input grid had the dimensionality of the grid in the first dimension, so the X and Y uh, dimensions as, as the first dimension of the tensor, we put them here as, as the last dimension of the tensor, since uh, that's what the, the grid sample function expects. We could, uh, ooh, to get the same shape back, we could transpose this whole thing. And uh, now you can see that whereas the uppermost pixel, left uppermost pixel was first at the location minus one, minus one, it is now at minus one, one. Let's see whether we think this is correct. So the uppermost left pixel is now at minus one, one, which would indicate that um yeah that makes sense right guys because this would be the x dimension this would be the y dimension cool let's see okay so i think that's clear now <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so I suggest also looking at the, indeed we use the, the grid sample function quite a lot. I think I have a note on it somewhere. Don't remember exactly where, uh, but um, maybe it's also good to check out the documentation for that function. Um, just to be more clear on what it does exactly. So basically you just give it an, an, a grid or a batch of grids as input and it samples whatever function or whatever uh, feature map or whatever kernel you give it as, as its first input argument based on the, on the grid you give it in the second argument. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I had a hard time with the documentation on that as well. But we figured it out in the end. All right, so let's get to the lifting convolution. So here, again, basically uh, an intuition of what the lifting convolution actually does. Um, so the input to this operation is defined, for example, over R2. You have an X and a Y dimension. But the same feature can occur under different rotations, let's say. So under different poses, under different uh, group actions of the rotation group. If we apply a lifting convolution with a, with a kernel K, which recognizes this feature in, let's say, this is, a, is its canonical position upright. We end up with a feature map since we apply this kernel at every location, but also at every rotation in the group. We end up with a feature map, which is defined over X and Y, but also over the rotation domain. And then I shall see. So this uh, occurrence of the feature is in its canonical position. So under a rotation of zero degrees. So its response also ends up in a feature map corresponding to the rotation of zero degrees. And for these two other features, they're rotated counterclockwise by 90 degrees. Their responses also end up in the feature map corresponding to rotation of 90 degrees. Um, yeah, so here again, just a, an overview of what, what the lifting convolution actually does. So we can, because we, we're only looking at these, these affine groups, these special groups, you can always uh, perform a, the group action of an element G, which consists of a translation and some other a, a group element of some other groups, so for example, rotation. So let's say your group element G consists of a rotation and a translation. You can always instantiate this action as first rotating. So first applying the action of, of the group element corresponding to the group H and subsequently applying a translation. And this is also in practice how we actually implement it in, in neural networks. So also important to note is that uh, for the convolution operation itself, we actually use PyTorch's implementation of Conf2D. So we use a, a neat little trick which allows us to continue using this operation since it takes a lo lot of hard work out of our hands. We don't need to translate the kernel to every position in the input. We don't need to take the inner product between these translated kernels. So all that is left for us to do is to define a set of kernels which uh, are rotated copies of one another. Uh, the first thing we need to do then is, is to implement this, this kernel. So implement a kernel that we can actually rotate. And Similar as before, we provide you with a base class, um, which will subsequently implement for the rotation group using this, uh, this uh, grid sample function. So again, um, this grid sample function, we're basically making use of, of interpolation to, to obtain our rotated kernels. And if we're working with, with degree of, or if we're working with 90 degree rotations this is absolutely fine because all the grid points after rotation also fall on other grid points. So you can just, you could also just obtain your rotated kernels by permuting um, the input kernel basically. But as soon as you start working, for example, with 45 degree rotations, this method won't work because you need to obtain kernel values for locations that actually fall, let's say between the, the pixels of your original kernel. So you would have to apply some interpolation, for example, method, or another thing that people often do is to define your kernels in, in a basis, a continuous basis, and then sample 
So basically you, you make a function, a continuous function, which maps from the domain of the kernel to kernel values. And then you can just sample this function at arbitrary locations. You don't have this, uh, these interpolation artifacts that we'll also see later. So this base class basically implements all you need to, or the functions, defines at least the functions that you would need to implement a kernel that can, can transform under the action of a group. So again, here we see the grid that we're going to define our kernel on. So it's just another mesh grid of uh, kernel size by kernel size. And also the corners here are of course two dimensional since we're still, we're implementing a, a lifting convolution. Um, and then we transform this grid by getting all the group elements of the group and applying the action of the group on R2 using these elements. So this inverse, of course, support, I think I forgot to mention this previously, but um, make sure you understand why this inverse is there. It's, let's see. Oh, here it is. You can also see it here. So if you want to rotate, for example, let's say we're rotating, if you want to rotate a function of the origin, you can do that by inversely rotating the domain of that function. So I think um, this should be quite clear to everyone, but let's go to this image here, for example. If we want to obtain the pixel value for this uh, location here, how we would obtain this pixel value is, even though this is a rotation of 270 degrees um, counterclockwise, wait, Am I saying that correctly? Well, it's a, it's a rotation uh, counterclockwise, but we actually uh, obtain this value by taking the, the inverse rotation of the domain. So going back to this original location at the top left here and obtaining the uh, value for that pixel there. Uh, so that's what the uh, the inverse is doing there. Um, so this then yields a transformed grid. And then subsequently we can implement methods of actually sampling the, sampling the, the kernel values at the, the locations of the transformed grid. And again, we'll implement this using the grid sample function. So we're just going to use basic interpolation to obtain these kernel values, but you could also implement um, a different way of, of sampling these uh, these kernels yourself. Um, so here we just just have a quick uh, show of, of the transformed grid. So we can see here that the grid indeed rotates counterclockwise. And now we need to sample this grid actually. So that's what the class that we defined here does. We define a set of weights. So this is just our, our canonical kernel that we saw previously. And these are the weights that we're going to transform to actually obtain our, our rotated uh, kernel values. And then sampling this function just comes down to um, basically using this grid sample function with the weights as input and uh, transformed grid as uh, the grids that we should value or, or that we want to sample this, this uh, input weight on. Um, and then some notes should be taken because the grid that we use as input here now has a, a uh, like the batch dimension that we were talking about. We want to obtain transformed weights for each of the group elements. So this um, kernel grid also contains a dimension. I think we saw it here. Yeah, this kernel grid also contains a dimension for the number of, of group elements that we're actually sampling. So for rotations of 90 degrees, this group has four elements. So this is the basically the, the dimension that um, in which these different rotated kernel grids are stacked. And then we should also uh, repeat this weight 
by the number of times that that uh, we want the or yeah by, by the number of times that we have uh, group elements in our group basically to account for this and then here we have a sampling of the transformed weight which now contains as additional dimension the number of output group elements so basically how you could see this is that you have a filter bank for each uh, group element in your group so this is what a what a regular the the weight of a regular cnn would look like and then we have the additional dimension which uh, corresponds to the size of the group that we're, we're uh, applying this convolution for and here we take the transpose of, of this uh, these first two dimensions just to uh, keep it all orderly later on all right so now that we've implemented our kernel we can actually start sampling the different rotated kernels so that's what we visualized here you have the canonical let's say canonical kern kernel under a rotation of zero degrees as you can see this kernel then rotates in this dimension by 90 degrees it's ratio of 90 degrees and of course this um also good to mention this uh, set of weights also has, has dimensions for the number of input and output channels of course um okay so any questions up until now all right then let's continue now that we've implemented the the kernel or a way to sample the the different transformed kernels we can actually start applying the lifting convolution itself and this now it's quite simple so there is one thing to keep in mind or one trick that we use I, i'd say is we still want to be able to use the conf2d class of pytorch to perform our convolutions and um, we can do this quite easily by just treating the the group dimension of our convolution kernels as as uh, additional output channels so how you can see a, a convolution with let's say three output channels is as subsequently applying convolutions over the input with three different convolution kernels right so if we additionally want to apply convolutions with for example four rotations for each of these kernels we could just fold the uh, group dimension of our convolution kernels into the output channel dimension and have pytorch conf to the subsequently apply all these kernels separately basically um yeah but this, that's also explained here so make sure that you you kind of understand what we're doing here um so we sample the convolution kernels and then just apply the conf to the pytorch function uh, after reshaping our, our kernel such that we fold the the group dimension into the output channels dimension so basically this for pytorch it now just seems like each rotated version of of an input or each rotate, rotated version of a kernel is just another output channel um so it will just give the response for each of these uh, different rotated versions of the kernels also in the output channel dimension. So here we fold those those dimensions uh, or we separate those dimensions again. Um, yeah, so this operation in the end, as we discussed, yields a feature map, which is now not defined only over the spatial dimensions but also over the group itself. So our feature map basically has an additional dimension, as we could see before. All right, and then subsequently we can move on to the group convolution. So here just a quick visualization of what the group action... Okay, so first it's important to note, of course, that since we now have a feature map that is also defined over the group, our kernels are also going to be defined over the group as well. So whereas for the lifting convolutions, our kernels were only defined over the spatial domain. And yes, we did have different copies of uh, transformed kernels, but all those kernels were still only 
um, defined over the spatial domain. Now in group convolutions, we also have the uh, group H as additional dimensions for both the feature maps and then of course also of the, the kernels. So I think Eric also discussed this, but um, you could visualize the, the action of, of a group element on a feature map or a kernel defined over the entire group via this, this sort of twist shift motion. So in green here, we visualize the, the action of the, the rotation by 90 degrees, which results in, well, moving from this figure here left to the figure here right, you can see that the feature map now contains rotated or this, these kernels now contain rotated features. But since we're also, this grid is also defined over the group itself, rotation actually has a, an action on this grid defined along the group as well. Because the grid point that is, for example, defined in the canonical input here at, let's say, a, a grid point of zero along the group axis, applying a rotation of 90 degrees now lands this point at well, the coin, point corresponding to a rotation of 90 degrees, right? Because that's what the group product does. So there's also this notion of a shift along the group dimension. And then, of course, it's important to remember that since it's a group, and in this case for the rotation group, especially you have this notion of, of uh, a well, it's a kind of a circular motion, right? So this feature map that we had defined at the outermost grid point in the in the input, after shifting it ends up down here again because of this closure property. Let's see, we have a question. Is the feature map with the two circles only for illustration here? Shouldn't they all be squiggles in the corresponding rotations? No, so this is, um, yes, indeed, it is only for illustration here. So, <laughs> But it is important to note that this this kernel here contains can contain different values at each of these um, group element locations. So we don't require the kernel to have uh, this th this same squiggle, for example, in each of these locations under a rotation, uh, because um, okay. So basically, the the, the important thing to realize here is that your feature map, just as your feature map in, in uh, conventional CNNs is defined over two spatial dimensions, your feature map is now also defined over, over the group itself. So over this additional H dimension. So you have a response for each of these um, rotations as well, not only for every spatial location, but also for every rotation. And then your input or your kernel function is defined over a group as well. However, it's just that it's just a, a function mapping from the group. So from every spatial location and every uh, rotational group element, let's say, to a value to a scalar value. Um, and this also means that for each of these rotational grid points, the kernel values can of course be different. So we don't require the same squiggle to show up in each of these rotational, um, let's say, yeah, lo rotational uh, grid points in our kernel. Is it clear? Is it clear why that's the case? Why there's not there's not the necessarily the same squiggle at each of these rotation dimensions? Okay, so two more questions. So are the elements of the group itself the kernels that we apply? No, the elements of the group are just that. They are the elements of a group which can have an action on functions that are defined over spaces. So for example, a kernel is just a function defined over, or a conventional CNN kernel is just a fu function defined over R2, which maps to a kernel value, right? So at every location in your kernel, you have a kernel value. And then group elements can act on this space 
So the group elements from the rotation group, for example, they rotate the grid points corresponding to this kernel. So you apply the group elements to the kernel. You don't, uh, they're, they're, the group elements itself are not the kernels that you apply. If you add another group like scaling, do you get another mention here? Yes, indeed. Yeah, so um, currently we're only, in this tutorial, we're only working with a one-dimensional rotation group. So you get a single dimension here. But indeed, if you would add another group like scaling, which is called, so then you have the group of translations, rotations, and dilations. It's called the similarity transformation group. Then your feature map also gets an additional dimension. So it would be a bit harder to visualize here, but yeah. So is that like saying that each feature map along the H axis has different trainable weights? Yes, indeed. So for the kernel at least, yeah. So the kernel is now uh, defined not only over the spatial domain, but also over the group domain. But I don't think you should think of it as, as different feature maps along the along the group domain, because you don't think of it as different feature map maps along the spatial domain either. They're just different locations in your in your kernel. And along this group axis, this, the same thing holds. So they're just different locations in your kernel. So the, the only difference is that whereas here, um, let's see, let's go back here for the CNNs. Let's see if I wrote it out somewhere. Yeah. Um, mm, maybe I didn't, but okay. Well, your kernel for conventional CNNs is just a function mapping from the domain R2 to a scalar value. So in conventional CNNs, this stays the same for every feature map throughout your network. The difference now only is that after we've performed this lifting convolution, our feature maps also contain this, this group dimension. And hence, the kernels that you use to convolve over these also need to have this additional group dimension. So it now is no longer a function from R2 mapping to a scalar value. It's now a function from the group mapping to a scalar value. So each of these different group elements can have different scalar values. The only requirement is that, well, that there's no requirement in that sense, actually. So that's what we say here, that now the kernel defined over the group, or the, the kernel that you use in group convolutions is defined over the entire group. So it maps from the semi direct product of the translation group with another group, so for example, rotations to a scalar value. Let's see. So if we have four rotations, the group only has four elements. Yes, and we apply these, and we can apply those elements to the kernels to rotate them. Indeed, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly the, the right intuition. So yeah, in, in conventional CNNs, you actually do exactly the same thing, but only for translations, for the group of translations. You shift your kernel over the entire input domain, and at every location, you take the inner product of this transformed, translated kernel with the feature map. And the only thing different is now that we also not only so not only do we translate the kernel to every location, we also rotate it by every possible rotations. So in simple terms, you create invariance here by rotating one single kernel or scaling your kernel, and then aggregating the response over all those rotations scalings. Um, that's, that only happens, so the invariance only happens in the end with the projection layer, but yes, that's that's what you do. But up until now, so these, these lifting convolution and these group convolutions, they are, are known as equivariant operations. So you don't have invariance to rotations yet, but uh, because the feature maps do change for different rotations in the input, but they do contain the same information only at different locations. Sorry, could you recap the meaning of the fish symbol between R2 and H? Yeah. So this fish symbol, fish symbol is 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 a semi-direct product. It basically denotes that um, the group G, which is an affine group, consists of the semi-direct product between the translation group R2 and a group of interest H, and it's called a semi-direct product 
as opposed to a direct product because we have this notion of, of uh, let's go back up here. Um, of an action of the rotation group on the translation group itself. So let's see, where do we define this? Yeah, here. So taking the, the product of two group elements can be done for, for any of these, these elements in that are, that are part of a semi-direct product group can be done by, um, such as we see here. So we, okay. Every element of, of a semi-direct product group consists of two parts, the translation part and the, for example, rotation part or scaling part or whatever other group you happen to be working with, but taking the product of these elements of such elements. So let's say you have a, a translation and a rotation by zero degrees and a translation and a rotation by 90 degrees, taking the product of two of these elements, then isn't just as simple as simply adding up the translations and adding up the rotations because this rotation part also has an action on the translation part. So that's why it's called a, a semi direct product because in taking the product between group elements, there's this, I, this notion of, of this action of a subgroup on another part of the group, basically. All right. Another question. Are we rotating the kernel around its own axis while translating the kernel in a global frame? That'd be a direct product as the two are kind of independent. I'm not sure that I understand your question exactly. So any, uh, group element applied to the kernel. Let's see what I mean is that we rotate the kernel and always translate it along the image in the same way. Yes. But okay. So one of the, one of the nice things of, of such uh, these affine groups is that you can always realize the action of any group element to, uh, to, to subsequent operations. So first a rotation and then a translation. And that's also how we actually implement it here. Um, but no, the, 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 the it's always, it remains a, a semi-direct product because if you were to take the product of two of these group elements, then you would have to, uh, yeah, th this, well, as I was just explaining, there's this notion of, of the action of the group on the spatial domain as well. I think yeah. Gabriella also. Yeah, sorry, just to add the one thing is that uh, I, I see what you mean, uh, but the definition of take into account that the definition of a semi direct product, right, is something on top of a uh, direct pro product of the underlying set, right? So a direct product of uh, the two groups, right, is a set that contains all possible pairs, right? And the notion of semi-direct product tells us that uh, there's also some special action of one of the two groups on the other. Uh, but what we are talking about here is just kind of a, a set uh, the, uh, theoretic uh, um, uh, notion. Like we just want to iterate over all group elements and say, for each of them, we do this uh, and that, right? Uh, so yeah, of course, we're going to have every possible translated version of the kernel and translated versions of it. And it doesn't matter like how the rotation acts uh, on the on the plane because of the semi-direct product. Uh, what matters is that you have every possible translation and every possible rotation. Uh, is that uh, what you were asking? Uh, okay. Okay. All right. So let's continue on. Um, Okay, so we were just talking about how now that we have feature maps that are, de that are defined over the entire group, we also need kernels that are defined over the entire group. And we need to implement the, the group action on these kernels as well, because we still want even after these these uh, group convolutions to 
or we want these group confluences to be equivariant as well. So we need to apply each of these kernels that are now defined over the entire group, also for every translation and rotation group element. Um, and as you can see, doing this again gives us a feature map which is defined over the entire group. Okay, so um, yeah, as a note here, as I was also uh, mentioning previously, since okay, let the translation group maybe that's also what you were referring to. The translation group does not have an action on the on the rotation group itself. So if you translate something, it's pose or its orientation is not affected, right? So we can make use of the trick here by um, creating a, a grid over the entire group under all possible transformations of the group by first creating grids for rotation group, so for age and for R2 separately, and then applying the actions separately, and then just taking the, the uh, uh, Basically, taking an, an uh, sort of creating a mesh grid of these transformed H and R2 grids to finally yield a set of uh, grids, convolution kernel grids, which are defined over the entire group, which have been transformed with every group element as well. Let's see another question. Is it true that only the relifting step is equivariant to? Rotation, not the group convolutions after, because we know them. No, this is this is not uh, this is not correct. So I think there's still a bit of confusion about. Hmm, let's see how can I best explain this. So our feature maps are defined over the entire group, even though for conventional CNNs the feature maps are only defined over the spatial domain. The feature maps now are defined over the entire group. So it's a function mapping from the group to a scalar value. So for every translation and rotation, we have a separate value. Um, this means that if we want to apply a convolution to this feature map, we also need a convolution kernel that is defined over the entire group. So this convolution kernel has this additional group dimension. and as we explained, there, there are not necessarily any constraints on the weights within this kernel, but to have an operation that is ultimately equivariant again. So we could just, what we could do is just apply this single kernel at every spatial location. And then we get as output a feature map, which has only a, a, a spatial dimension, right? So you kind of, I guess, uh, yeah, reduce the, the feature map defined over group back into a feature map defined only over the spatial domain. But because we also transform this kernel by every possible group element and apply it to our input, we again get a feature map that is defined over the entire group. So we also rotate this kernel or we apply the action of each rotation group element to this kernel as well. We apply or we take the inner product with our feature input feature map with every transformed rotated kernel as well. But now this rotation action is a bit more complicated since it not only rotates the spatial domain or the spatial dimensions of your kernel, but it also translates your uh, grid along the group dimension. So. Um, that gives us in the end, again, an, an operation which is equivariant to the group, not uh, invariant. So we do still share the weights over, over different transformations. However, only in, in um, let's say, the, the output group dimension. So there are two kind of two group dimensions at play here. There's this dimension of the feature map in the input. And then there's this dimension of the group in the feature map in the output. To get a signal defined over this, uh, the group also in the output, we again need to transform our kernel for every 
rotation and apply it to the input. Um, but our kernel is now defined over the entire group, as we can see here. So rotating it uh, results in this, this twist shift motion. But if I were to apply this kernel, which is defined over the entire group, only at every spatial location, then yes, indeed, this operation would not be equivariant. But now, since we also rotate it by every possible rotation, it is still equivariant. So you share, indeed, you share the weights for different transformation group elements in the output dimension of the group, but not necessarily in the input dimension. I hope that's, that's kind of clear, this distinction between in and output. Uh, so you compress the spatial dimensions in the kernel, but at the same time use the kernel per group, so you end up with the same group dimensionality. I don't exactly know what you mean by compressing the spatial dimensions. Um, what I mean is that if you use a kernel for the input, which has multiple sort of layers for groups, mm -hmm. you basically get... Um, um, You basically, well, yeah, now now that I'm saying it also doesn't make sense. To me, it would just seem that if you keep adding rotation variance in every step, you would just add layers and layers upon layers. No, okay, okay, yeah. So now it's, it is important to note that applying a single convolution with a single convolution kernel like this only yields one value, right? Because you integrate over the entire group. So you integrate, we can see that here you integrate for a conventional CNN, you do an integration over the entire spatial domain of the kernel, right? So you, you take the sum basically of all uh, possible locations in the kernel, taken as inner product with the, with the input. But now in group convolutions, this integral also changes. So you basically sum over not all, only all spatial locations, but also all rotational locations. So in the end, you still end up when you apply a single convolution with a single scalar value. So um, you don't really keep adding additional rotation dimensions since a single convolution with a single kernel still only yields a single scalar value. Only by additionally applying the rotation transformations onto this kernel, we again get a feature map, which is also defined over the entire group. Can yeah, it's okay. You... okay. Yes, it's clear? Sorry. Yeah, I think it's clear. So what I meant with compress is basically, I think what you said is that if you use convolution, it yields one scalar, so it doesn't yield the result for each, uh, each group. But then you also add the dimensionality again by using multiple rotations in the next step. Exactly, yeah, 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 that's exactly okay. it, yeah. Can you think of your convolution kernel as a cube that moves in R3 intuitively? Um, I mean, you could, but I wouldn't, <laughs> because uh, this additional dimension isn't isn't another, let's say, real line, for example. If you had, say that this is R3, then you would be saying that the group dimension is, is a real line as well, and it's, it's, yeah, I don't think that uh, would be a helpful way of visualizing it. So how do you do weight sharing if you implement the group convolution as all these separate? Okay, so we don't um, you don't okay, so in the end, if we are going to implement but that only comes uh, later, yes, we still make use of the PyTorch conf to the implementation. However, you shouldn't think of that, think of it as just applying all these separate 2D convolutions, at least after the lifting convolution. So yeah, in the lifting convolution, indeed, we only apply 2D convolutions with transformed kernels because our kernels are only 2D. Here, our kernels are actually 3D, so you have this, this idea of an, of an integral over the entire group, right? <clears throat> um, 
so that's also how the convolution in the end is going to be implemented as a as a, an integral of this entire group and then you implement the weight sharing by uh well implementing the action of your group on the grid that uh, makes up our kernel so this kernel still has as grid values of course there's still a grid now also defined not only over spatial locations but additionally the group and we can still transform this grid using the group action action and so we do that for every group element and we get a, a separate convolution kernel for every group element each of these kernels is defined over the entire group but each of them are transformed copies of one another and transformed by this twist shift motion that you see here okay and then next also how do you do multiple groups since your channel dimensions are take on rotation here yeah since so um if you were for example to do the rotation dilation group so take scalings as well as rotations um you're in luck because the scale the dilation group doesn't have an action on the rotation group and vice versa so rotating something doesn't affect its scale and scaling something doesn't affect its orientation so you can just treat each of the the kernels for each of these separate group elements just again as separate uh yeah separate kernels and share them or also fold them into the output channel dimension so you can just continue on the same way you're you are already doing let's see another question if we define our group action as such to avoid the translation of group elements on every action to avoid the translation of group elements on every action does it stop being representation um can we change our group product to fix it or does it stop being group no we, we there's no this uh we saw what we saw here previously We don't do any special tricks here or anything. This is just how the how the group action of a group element from any affine group is implemented. It's always this 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 notion of the the two so the spatial part and the let's say other subgroup part, which always have this very specific interaction that the for example rotation part of the group by taking the group product. It's just that taking the group product of, of the rotation part and then the rotation has an action on the spatial part so this there's no weird tricks here or anything this is all completely correct it's still a, a representation um it's still a group this is just this is how uh, affine groups work okay let's move on um okay so here we same as with the lifting convolution we have a grid but now the grid is not only defined over r2 it's also defined over h and as i just said we can since we're using it using affine groups the translation group has no action on the rotation group so we can uh, create a grid which is defined over the entire group for all transformed or for all transformations from the group by first just transforming the the grid over h itself by all um possible rotations for example and then subsequently transforming the r2 grid by all possible rotations and basically slapping them on top of each other and we're fine so that's that's what we do here that's also what this weird huge operation here does it's just it just concatenates the the separate grids that we created i suggest uh yeah checking out the dimensionality and uh seeing whether you understand uh, why it is the way it is all right so now our kernel grids have this additional dimension which is also defined over the group so um here we visualize the group actions for the rotation group or the, for the rotational part of the kernel grid and for the for the translational part of the kernel grid i should say and for the rotational part of the kernel grid separately first so this is the let's say the group dimension and you see that each group elements tra translates the the grid along the 
uh, group axis. And then taking these grids together, we end up with these different kernel grids. So we can see again this twist shift motion that we were talking about. This line of uh, um, blue grid points is just to indicate, to give a, a point of reference. So we can see that applying each group element to the kernel grid, we get this, this twist shift motion again. And we can use these grids then to sample our, uh, our uh, weights. Luckily, the grid sample function also works in 3D. So that's nice for us. Then we move on to the uh, kernel itself. So again, we're going to use interpolation. So we first define a filter bank, uh, which will serve as our, our canonical uh, kernel, let's say, under, under canonical rotation and translation. Now it's important to note that what we were talking about just now, the fact that the, these, this kernel now has this additional group dimension, right? So for each of these uh, group elements, we basically have a separate um, weights as well. And sampling this, it's pretty much the same as we saw for the lifting convolution. So we, uh, Again, fold the in and output channels into the same dimension just to make it easier for the grid sample function. Um, we still want a weight for each, or we want a kernel for each um, rotation group element. So we repeat the input weights and then we simply apply the grid sample function again now with our 3D grids. Um, and then we end up with a set of weights, which is now slightly different from the set of weights that we saw in the lifting convolution. So let's go back there first, see, compare. Here we had a set output channels by input channels defined over a certain kernel size and basically a separate kernel for each group element. And now we have Again, output channels, input channels, but now the additional uh, group dimension that our feature map has, and still the same kernel size. And um, we still want to obtain a response for each of the group elements in the output as well. So we have this additional dimension, which basically uh, signifies the, the different transformative versions of our convolution kernels. Okay, and then can sample some weights and here, um, so our kernels are now these, these 3D objects, but to make it a bit easier to uh, see the kernel values themselves, here we flatten them, them into 2D. So basically, uh, these are just different or spatial kernels for different rotational elements aligned along the Y axis here. So you can see the, the red um, outline is tracking a single kernel as it basically moves through this, uh, let's say 3D structure. So you can see this rotating again, but also the shift motion along the yeah, axis for different group elements. Okay, John, I'm, I'm uh, gonna circle back to your question later when we've got through the entire notebook because I think I'll need to think about this a bit more. Can you repeat what the y-axis indicates on each sub-figure? Yes. Uh, so, okay. The kernels have, as we can see here, the kernels are these 3D objects, right? So the two spatial dimensions and the additional group dimension. However, um, plotting the sampled kernels like this wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to interpret interpret them very well. So what we're just doing is sampling for each of these grid points a kernel value. And we visualize those sampled kernel values here. Only whereas here we plotted them in 3D. So we have a separate, uh, or we have a, the additional group dimension as the Z axis here. We basically uh, flatten this by stacking the Z axis into the Y axis. So we take each of these spatial grids along the group dimension and we 
concatenate them in the in the y axis to uh, yeah to, to get our uh, visualization so basically here this single outlined um, part here is is just one spatial kernel along the group axis for example and applying then the group action to this kernel shifts this outlined uh, kernel and rotate, rotates it. Oh, so this is only for visualization, by the way. We don't actually uh, use them like this in the in the convolution steps or anything. This is just to get a feel for what's what's happening uh, with our convolution kernels. But plotting this in three D wouldn't you wouldn't be able to interpret it very well. So we plotted them in three D, but just for visualization, keep that in mind. Okay, then next, the group convolution operation is actually quite simple. So again, we make use of the same trick that we did previously, um, where we fold the output group dimension into the output channels dimension and have PyTorch basically apply each of these transformed kernels separately, get a, get a, a response for each of these kernels separately. But since our feature maps are now also defined over the group, we apply the same trick um, in the in the input, let's say, by folding the group dimension of our input feature maps into the channel dimension. And again, again, we can do this because the uh, integral that we saw here, all the way back at the top. The integral that we saw here now is, extends over the entire group itself, right? So the conf2d operator normally it applies for each of your output channels a separate kernel to the input, but you always sum over all the input channels, right? So a convolution over a signal with a multiple channels generally sums over the entire input channels altogether. So since you basically want to do the same with our group dimension, we just want to sum over the entire group. We can just treat the group dimension the same as the channel dimension. So we fold the group dimension into the input channel dimension of our feature map. And then we can still use uh, conf2d the same as we did before, as we'll see here. So, um, Okay, we have the input x, which is as a batch dimension, input channels, group dimension, and spatial dimensions. But now what we do is we fold the group dimension into the input channel dimension. That's the operation we see here. Because we can do this again, because we just want to sum over the, or want to take the integral over the entire group dimension as well, same as with the input channel. So we want to treat them the same. So we'll have PyTorch conf 2D just treat them the same as well. So now our, our uh, convolution kernels are reshaped by basically folding the output group dimension. So each separately transformed kernel into the output channels dimension, and then having the group dimension of each kernel folded into the input channels dimensions of the same kernel. And then we can still use conf2d. So that's pretty much it as far as the uh, implementing of different operation goes. Okay, and then a question. What's the reason why the first square has a, only one cross and in the 2D picture it has a whole row of crosses? I'm not sure what you mean there. Good so, Hello? There is a whole row of crosses. But, but the, the crosses are just, are just uh, to give you a reference point. They're, they don't signify anything. Okay, but if you go up a little more, up, up or down, up, yeah, yeah, or no, even more up. There they okay. So here they only have one cross in the in the oh, corner. Okay, yeah, no, that's that's true. Um, okay, so that's that's a bit of, a bit of a mismatch between these figures, but there should be ah, a okay. whole then, row here. Yeah, okay, yeah. that makes sense. Good point. Yeah, but again, this is just for for reference, so don't uh, worry too much about it. Okay, so we implement the group convolution operation. Um, the last step, projection, uh, we don't really need to do anything special for this because 
taking or doing a max projection is just taking the max operation or just applying the max operation basically to your feature map. So you uh, project your entire feature map, which is now defined over the entire spatial domain and the group into a single point via max projection or, or um, mean pooling or whatever you want to use. It just needs to be an operation that is invariant to the group action. So invariant to translations and rotations. So then our CNN, finally, we can implement it, consists of this lifting convolution, which takes a, has a number of input channels, number of output channels, and then a series of group convolutions. Finally, followed by the projection layer, and here we used a mean projection. So this is just simply taking the mean over the group dimension and the two spatial dimensions that still remain in your feature map to end up with an, an invariant quantity under the group. And then finally, uh, this is followed by a single linear layer, which maps from the number of hidden channels to the upper channels. Um, and then in actually using this network, we also apply uh, some normalization. That's just to, to stabilize training. Um, using layer norm is fine, using batch norm is also fine if you just take, you have to make sure that uh, you, uh, the, the operation throughout your network need to be uh, either invariant or equivariant to, to the group action. So if you, for example, want to apply layer norm, you're going to have to apply it over not only the spatial dimensions and the channel dimension, but also over the group dimension itself. So that's just what we're doing here. Uh, so forwarding an actual image through this network is just applying the lifting convolution, uh, normalization, activation function, number of group convolutional layers, finally applying the uh, projection. So you end up, before this operation, you have a feature map which has a number of channels. Okay, so a batch, of course, batch size, a number of channels, a group dimension, and two spatial dimensions. And after this projection layer, you have a batch dimension and a channel dimension. That's it. All your entire domain is, is uh, collapsed to a single point, basically, an invariant quantity under the group. Um, OK, and to compare, we also implement a regular conventional CNN, which is just the, the same architecture, only applying to these. And then um, we experiment with this in the following way. We want to show that. Uh, Okay, we now have a, a network that is that is uh, equivariant or ultimately invariant to this, this uh, rotation action. Does it actually work? So does it actually generalize to uh, transformations of the input under different group elements, basically? So we show this by training each of these networks on MNIST, where the training set is just MNIST as you know it, so it's just regular upright images. And the test for the test set, we uh, apply a, a random rotation to each of the images between 0 and 360 degrees. And the conventional CNN is not going to perform very well, of course, the test set because it doesn't uh, understand that rotated images can contain the same, or basically the, the rotated features are the same as the original features or should lead to the same classification as the original features. Um, but if everything works out, then our um, group CNN should be able to generalize at least partially to the test set as well. Of course, we only implemented equivariance here for rotations of 90 degrees. So having a rotation, for example, of 45 degrees, give a bit of a different response also in our network. But uh, uh, it is at least more invariant to oh, it is at least more invariant to uh, um, rotations than a uh, conventional CNN would be I think I just disconnected so I'll run everything again um, so it needs to install something first now but uh, let's see is there any questions about any of the operations we saw at this point. I think we're running a bit. It's almost uh, time already. 
took me longer than I expected going through this with you guys together, but this is going to be fine. Let's see, so the GC then can distinguish between six and nine despite their images being egg frame. So that's a good question. No, it cannot because um, uh, a six is just a nine under a, a rotation of 180 degrees, right? So it indeed is not going to be able to to distinguish between six and nine, which is indeed a good point that for uh, distinguishing between sixes and nines, this this uh, equivariance actually hurts the hurts the the network itself because it is ultimately invariant to rotations of ninety degrees. So it doesn't it can't see the difference between these rotations of ninety degrees. Okay, so here we have uh, a couple of images which are randomly sampled from the uh, from the data set rotated so this this top row is the the training set and then the bottom is the rotated versions and we use some pytorch lightning to speed up the whole training process you can go through this yourself which is fine okay um and here we use pre-trained models just to speed everything up but you can uh, you can also train them yourself if you'd like um okay so if we test both the regular CNN and the GCNN on the test set where the images are randomly rotated, we can see that CNN is able to get some of the um, the, uh, the test images right, which it makes sense because, uh, for example, the one if you were to rotate it by 180 degrees, it's still going to be recognized as a one, of course. A zero is also somewhat invariant to rotations, but there are going to be other digits like this four which the network has no idea what to do with, of course. So it gets a, a, an accuracy of uh, 46%, whereas the GCNA, which is invariant to rotations of 90 degrees, actually gets 91%, which is pretty good. So it's not as high as the accuracy on the training set, because as I was saying, our network is only invariant to uh, degrees which are mul or uh, rotations which are multiples of 90 degrees. So it's gonna still get some of them wrong, but it still gets quite a nice accuracy. Do people use these kinds of GC? And Eric does mention a continuous way of doing this instead of either picking a finite group or discretizing infinite one zero pH signals, which are like a pure generalization it only has upsides. Yeah, that's a good point. In the next tutorial, we will see steerable CNN. So um, do people actually use these in practice? I have no idea. There's a lot of research being done into uh, regular CNNs, regular GCNNs. So they're called regular GCNNs because we made use of this regular representation. So this representation, um, which acts on the domain of the of the input feature maps. A nice thing about these methods is that they're very intuitive and interpretable, and we can use a lot of the functionality that already exists within uh, deep learning. Think of activation functions, for example, which work point-wise. We can just use them directly on our feature maps, whereas what will be discussed next week, steerable CNNs, um, indeed, they are they allow you to to uh, be actually equivariant not only to a discrete number of group elements, but also to um, continuous groups. But they do require a lot of special care. So. Um, You'll see all about it next week, but but uh, there, there are drawbacks as well there. So you, you also have to take care of, of uh, using special um, activation functions and such that, that work on feature maps within steerable CNNs. But um, yeah, so there's upsides and downsides to each of these methods. So one upside to these, this current method is that it's quite intuitive, easy to implement, and uh, yeah, gets it gets the job done, gets pretty good performance generally um yeah but you're only you can only implement them indeed for discrete groups so or at least um they don't naturally work on continuous groups such as the continuous rotation group you can so in the previous work i've, I've worked with sampling randomly sampling over the group you can of course make an approximation of the continuous group by randomly sampling the orientations over which your feature maps are defined so in that sense, you would be equivariant or approximately equivariant to to uh, the continuous rotation group, but 
generally your your discretize in the group yeah or your for example for the dilation group you need to truncate it as well so you can the the dilation group so scaling is of course is, a, is an infinite group so you can scale as something as big as you want but your feature maps need to be contained in a computer at some point so you can only have that many scaling group elements for example in your feature maps um Oh, good point. Maybe I should have gone over this. So the um, number of channels that we use here in the group CNN versus the CNN is smaller. And we did this to keep the number of parameters more or less the same. So um, as you can see, the GCNN and the CNN both have similar numbers of parameters. But you need to keep in mind that the convolution kernels that we use in these GCNNs are of higher dimensionality. So you have these this additional uh, rotation dimension basically your kernels are four times their size if you have four rotation group elements so you would need more four times more parameter parameters for a, a convolution kernel which maps to the same from the same number of input channels to the same number of output channels as with the regular cnn and usually this is something that, that people often look at as to explain performance of deep learning architectures is the number of parameters itself. So this is just, we, we basically reduce the number of hidden channels in the group CNN when compared to the CNN to show that even with uh, similar numbers of parameters, the GCNN will outperform the CNN. Um, is that clear? Okay. Um, then lastly, we can inspect what actually happens to the feature maps throughout the network when we rotate an image so we have a six years input and we rotate this input image by a number of uh, of uh, uh, degrees here and we put them first through the cnn so we look at the activations of the third convolution of uh, so the feature map after the third convolution. As you can see, when you rotate the input image, the uh, there's not, not really uh, a clear, it's not really clear what's happening to the to the activations. And this is exactly the point of, of uh, an operation, which is not equivariant, that there, there's no clear group action happening on the output domain of, of a normal convolution operation, which will also mean that if we, uh, use these to calculate uh, a classification in the end, the, the results are most likely gonna be different. Um, and then for the GCNN, our feature and maps now have this additional group dimension. And we can see that, uh, so the group dimensions here shown on the Y axis. So for every rotation, we have a, a separate spatial feature map. So that's how you could interpret it. For 90 degree rotations, we can see that our network is exactly equivariant. So the activations that would have shown up under zero degree rotations in this first feature map, under 90 degree rotations now show up in the second feature map under a rotation as so well. You can see this the same twist shift motion that's happening throughout the uh, throughout the, the uh, network. Let's see another question. Hidden channels should be four times less well okay so there's of course the the number of parameters in the lifting convolution is a bit different and then uh, the final linear layer has the same number of so it's it shouldn't be exactly four times less um, we just picked the number that that uh, made the numbers number of parameters uh, more or less equal okay so now finally we can look at the output for the CNN of the so this is for the conventional CNN the output this image ended up being a bit big the output of the conventional CNN for the rotated images so as you can see the output itself also changes which leads the network to uh, make a different classification most of the time probably and uh, here we can have the outputs for the uh, the GCNN. So you can see that the outputs or the activations of the last layer are more or less the same for each of the rotated inputs. 
And the reason that they're not exactly the same is, of course, because our network isn't actually a covariant to 45 degree rotations, but only to 90 degree rotations. So you can see these 90 degree rotations representations there are exactly equivalent. So this is after the cooling operation. Okay, another question. I thought part of the point for geometric B burn is that you can have the weight sharing and have fewer parameters, not more. Yeah. So indeed, that's uh, that that is the idea. Um, basically, what we sh show here is that uh, with the same number of weights, you can get better performance, right? So through increased weight sharing, you obtain better performance. Uh, so yeah, reducing the number of parameters would would uh, or I mean another way of viewing it would be that you can have reduced numbers of parameters and still get the same performance. Um, but we showed it here by having better performance with similar numbers of parameters. Okay, that's uh, that's about the entire tutorial, and I think yeah, it's also uh, quarter to one already. Um, I hope um, you guys were able to follow through this uh, tutorial a bit. I suggest you now uh, have a look at it yourself. And um, I guess, yeah, it's almost one already. So let's uh, do a last round of questions. How many tutorials are there going to be? Um, I believe that there's going to be four tutorials. So this first one is on regular group convolutions. And next week, we'll have a tutorial on steerable CNNs. And the weeks after, we're going to look at graph convolutions. And uh, the very last week, I'm not sure, I believe something like uh, hyperbolic VAEs. So VAEs which have a structured latent space. Is there any last questions on this tutorial? If you end up going through it yourself and you have uh, more questions, you can always email me. I have uh, put my email address at the top here. Um, or you can send a message through Canvas, that's also fine. So I suggest you going through this on your own as well, just to see whether you understand all the, uh, the actual implementational details that we've made. I've tried to write comments for all the weird stuff happening as good as possible, but um, yeah, so I was saying, if you do end up with any questions left over after you go through it yourself, then feel free to send me an email, that's fine as well. Um, yeah, and then some notes on the implementation itself. So we used interpolation here to obtain the uh, the uh, transformed kernels. There are, of course, different other methods that you could apply to obtain your uh, transformed kernels. So here we used interpolation. But so uh, I briefly mentioned this as well. There's also the, um, the possibility of using a, a basis in which you define your convolution kernels. Um, so in previous work, I've worked with actually parameterizing the convolution kernel as a neural network. That's also one way of doing it. So just having a neural network which maps from the domain of the kernel to an output value. And then it's trivial to assemble your, your kernel at these different locations, right? Because you can just transform the grid and input it into your neural network. And then you think kernel values for each of these uh, transformed grids. Uh, of course, this also has some caveats. There, there are certain conditions that uh, this network needs to have in order to perform well. Um, but at least you can get around the uh, aliasing effects that you have with interpolation, of course, or the interpolation artifacts, I should say. OK, um, I think that's about it from my side. If there's no more questions, then uh, I suggest you spend the last uh, 10 minutes going through it yourself. Good. OK, so yeah, I, I uh, hope uh, this gives a, a bit of uh, some insight into how you could actually implement these, these methods in real life. And yeah, feel free to also use this code, of course, if you would like to do a mini project on, uh, on uh, group convolutions, feel free to use this code for that as well, of course. And yeah, you can uh, 
for example, implement other groups. The dilation group is another group which is uh, interesting to implement. It has its own difficulties because, well, so I was mentioning previously, you need to truncate the group uh, ultimately. And this also means that as you transform your kernel through, through uh, dilation, so you have this, this group kernel, which is now def, uh, defined over the scale group as well. So it has this dilation axis. If you shift the kernel along the dilation axis, then part of your kernel is going to fall off, of course. So you need to make sure you're applying uh, or you're, you take care of boundary conditions uh, correctly. So it's a bit more difficult than rotations themselves, but it's also an, an, an interesting group to experiment with. A schedule for the Q&As. I don't know if there should be, I think. I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, Crystals after this uh, tutorial. Okay, yeah, I think that's about it. I'll um, stop sharing my screen and you guys uh, can start playing around with the notebook yourselves if you'd like for 10 more minutes or uh, yeah.